Well, good afternoon. My name is Will Marshall. I'm president of the Progressive Policy Institute, and I want to welcome you to this conversation on Will the Center Left Rise to the Populist Challenge? Uh, the Progressive Policy Institute, together with the Tony Blair Institute, is very proud to be able to present today uh, a speech by and a conversation with uh, the Right Honorable Tony Blair, former Prime Minister of Great Britain, on this topic of the populist challenge and what progressives need to do to rise to it. Uh, now, this event was originally scheduled as a public event in Washington. We had uh, several hundred people sign up to attend, uh, but we, we felt it was best, uh, given the coronavirus spread and contagion to, to cancel the public meeting. And so we're live streaming today. And thank you all who have joined or are joining us by live stream. And thank you also and welcome to C-SPAN and the C-SPAN audience to today's conversation. Uh, we, uh, you know, this is obviously the subject of the um, uh, state of emergency has been declared in Washington and it's a subject on everybody's uh, minds and we want to do our part to slow down the spread of this terrible virus, but we also want to carry on with business as usual as, as much as to the, as much as we can. We, we're inspired by London during the Blitz. So um, welcome to everybody. Uh, on a personal note, as we get started, I want to say how pleased I am to see Tony Blair after a, and to be reunited after a very long uh, hiatus. Uh, the Progressive Policy Institute uh, some years ago worked closely with President Bill Clinton and Prime Minister Blair in organizing the third way dialogues that really define the main currents of Western politics uh, in the late 1990s and the early aughts. Um, and how things have changed. Uh, the big story in the last decade is this populist revolt against political establishments uh, all around the democratic world. And some of the first tremors of this populist upsurge reached us from Great Britain uh, in 2016 with this unexpected vote pro-Brexit. And then, of course, we in the United States felt these tremors and in a shocking way, when seismically, when uh, Donald Trump uh, later in the same year took over the Republican Party and, uh, and won the uh, presidency. And in both cases, what was common, I think, to both, uh, both uh, events was that working class voters moved to the right and began to really scramble the old political alignments where the center left and center right parties uh, uh, competed for power. Um, and then uh, last December, we saw another important national election in Britain uh, and in which the defection of pro-Brexit and perhaps anti-Jeremy Corbyn uh, workers, working class voters, uh, their defection from labor helped fuel Boris Johnson's really huge victory there. Um, so what we see is populism or ethnic nationalism, it might be a more precise way of understanding this phenomenon, squeezing out space for the old center-right parties, moving most, much of the debate toward the populist right or the nationalist right. And this has also coincided with a steep decline in public support for center-left parties all over, the, all over the world, particularly in Europe. Uh, we see, you know, just watching from afar, we see the stirring of old demons in this ethnic nationalism that's afoot in Europe in places, particularly in Eastern Europe, but also obviously in Italy, uh, to some extent in Britain and, and France and elsewhere. Uh, but uh, this, this movement has triggered a crisis of political confidence across the democratic world. The old establishments, the old uh, dominant parties have been unable to deliver in a fundamental way to their publics. And uh, this, this is the reaction that we've, we, we've seen from that. So to our mind, it's essential that parties of the Progressive Center uh, offer a much more compelling alternative uh, to populism that is progressive and forward-looking and optimistic. And those are all, those are three great adjectives that describe uh, the man I'm about to introduce, Tony Blair. Um, Back in May 1997, uh, Tony Blair led the Labor Party out of an 18-year uh, political exile to its greatest victory ever. Uh, even before that, he had taken control of the party. As party leader, he had updated or begun the process of updating the Labor Party governing outlook and agenda, moving it from the kind of Fabian socialist beginnings to uh, a more modern creed that helped the party reach beyond its working class base to the aspiring middle class. And I think uh, that uh, uh, Tony Blair and his, and his uh, friends and helpers were in inspired by some of the things that Bill Clinton and the New Democrats were doing uh, in, uh, in the United States at the same time. 
As Prime Minister, uh, Tony Blair presided over strong economic growth. He reformed public services, reoriented welfare around work, also a theme we were uh, working on in the United States, reduced poverty, devolved power to Scotland and Wales, and helped to bring peace to Northern Ireland. And he also really was the spark who launched this unprecedented international dialogue among center-left parties and heads of state. I was a witness to a lot of these uh, third-way uh, uh, meetings and conversations, and no one made the case for a radically pragmatic, modernizing progress progressivism more trenchantly than Tony Blair. Blair. Uh, he had some rough patches, too. It wasn't all easy. Uh, there were internal rivalries uh, within his party to cope with. A fractious political press that always astounded me because they, they seemed to act as though they are the opposition party sometimes. Uh, and his support for the very unpopular Iraq war. But along the way, uh, Tony Blair won three straight national elections, served for 10 years, uh, the longest tenure of any labor leader in uh, UK history. After leaving office in 2007, he became a special envoy of the quartet on the Middle East until about 2015. He also founded the Tony Blair Institute, our partner in today's uh, uh, event, uh, the Institute for Global Change. This is, a great, uh, this, uh, this is a great place for analytical and scholarly work on populism and on the digital revolution that I think is also implicated in this populist moment. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Mark McGonigal and Jordan Kyle and Heather McNulty for all their help in making this day possible. So now uh, America faces a huge test of the staying power of populism this November with the, the re-election campaign of Donald Trump. And I can't think of a better time for us to hear Tony Blair's thoughts on how progressive parties of the center left can restore a culture of winning. So Tony Blair, please come out and let's hear from you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much indeed, uh, Will. It's great to see, to see you again. And um, yes, it's a slightly strange uh, way of, of doing this speech, but I, I hope everyone understands the reasons for that. And uh, these are indeed strange and, and, and troubling times. And so uh, it's not surprising that we have to do it in this way. Um, it actually reminds me of the very first big political speech I ever had to give, which is almost 40 years ago now, uh, when I was a young aspiring politician, I uh, went to address a meeting in a hall that uh, held 1,500 people, and only six people turned up. And I always remember in the middle of the speech that one of those fell asleep. And I remember leaving the hall at the end of it and thinking uh, that my political career was over before it had properly begun. So don't fall asleep, please, uh, as you, you listen to this. Um, so each day I, I, I wrestle with the question, does the progressive center have a demand problem or, or a supply problem? In other words, are we failing because we're offering something the voters don't want uh, or because we're failing to offer what they do want? Do they want the progressive center or do they not want it? Are we offering it or are we not offering it? And my conclusion, though I constantly revisit it, is that we have a supply problem. It's a commonplace that we live in an era of authoritarian populism. The evidence seems clear. Right-wing leaders ride the anger over immigration, globalization, and trade, whipping up discontent, demonizing opponents, making sure that they offend liberal sensibilities. The election, President Trump, Brexit, a UK government now with a thumping conservative majority, European writers on the march, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Duterte in the Philippines, the list goes on. And there is at least some consensus around the origins of the populism, the financial crisis, immigration, communities and people feeling left behind by globalization, an out of touch elite, tone deaf to people's concerns, and of course, the revolutionary phenomenon of social media, Politics is polarized, media is fragmented, even facts are contested. Our societies are splitting into two worlds, which don't talk to each other, listen to each other, or frankly, much like each other. So this critique is well understood in Western liberal politics, but there is an underlying assumption on part of the left that the electorate are driven by this dissatisfaction to desert the rational in favor of the irrational by voting for populists. 
And this assumption, I believe, is lazy, complacent, and profoundly lacking in self-criticism. The challenge of liberal democracy, in my view, is efficacy. It is the feeling that in the face of problems people want addressing, the prevailing powers will prevaricate, procrastinate, perambulate, but never prosecute. People feel that their world is changing without their consent and beyond their control, and they want someone to fix it. And the populists are answering that call. People want things to move, to change. Their leaders not to sit in front of the wall in endless contemplation, but to punch through it, if necessary, to offend in order to deliver. They want to see the job done. And the more the leader is surrounded by opponents shouting and reveling in vehement denunciation, the more that leader appears to them to be validated. And in response, the left has in two camps. The first camp represents the incarnational, reincarnation rather, of the old left. They share the basic desire for radical change. They too say the system is rigged and they feel that the moment they've spent a lifetime waiting for has finally arrived. And they're bolstered by a young generation of radicals with an agenda that they believe can align with that old agenda. The second camp are those that used to govern, who are appalled at the revival of the old left, preach moderation, but are derided as unexciting tinkerers in this era, de era demanding radical change. They sound like a, an acoustic version of an old heavy rock anthem, better suited in a club than a stadium, and in any event, still a song from the past. So the first camp offer the wrong solution, the wrong sort of change, and the other offer too little change. I spoke recently at the occasion of the Labour Party's 120th birthday, and I spoke of the four walls of impotence within which progressive politics risks imprisoning itself. The first is misreading the lessons of the financial crash by believing that the public turned sharply left on economic policy and against markets as a result. In fact, people understood completely the difference between a failure of the financial markets and a failure of the entire system of private enterprise. They are anti-greed, but they're not anti-wealth. The second was mistaking acceptance of the failures of policy post 9-11 and anxiety over the high cost of military engagement for a belief that the West was essentially to blame for the extremism. People never believe that and they distrust anyone who thinks it. The third is to pick up the gauntlet thrown down by the right and entertain a culture war of identity which the progressive side is certain to lose. And the fourth is to believe that what works for the right will also work for us so we match their populism with our own. The British Labour Party situated itself within these walls in December 2019 in our election and suffered the worst election defeat in our history. But around the Western world today, in medium-sized countries, let's say with populations over 20 million, progressive politics everywhere is on the defensive. Not one traditional left or center-left party is in majority power. Macron won, of course, by viscerating the old French Socialist Party. And traditional left parties are riven between moderates and left, and neither are winning. In my view, to beat populism, we have to be politically competent, strategically focused, and redefine the progressive challenge for the modern world. Redefine what being radical means. We need competence in defense and offense. For defense, we must recognize that populists exploit grievances, they don't invent them. The grievances are real, 
and rational. There is a problem with immigration, if not properly controlled. Showing you will control it is the only way you get permission to advocate it. Tough action against those who threaten our security and way of life is justified. The primary duty of government is to keep people safe. Pride in your country is not something to be despised, but to be celebrated. And a culture which, for example, means that elements within our universities and on campus no platform people with whom they disagree when by no reasonable definition could the disagreement be said to be outside the bounds of legitimacy. This repels normal people and they won't elect leaders who they think will be intimidated by such behavior. And it's no good saying it's a tiny minority. These issues have immense cut through. Very often I hear progressive politicians speak to the narrow activist audience for the cheers, but not to the majority of people in words that earn their silent approval. So these are basic points of culture, which if you're not touching, you're not listening. What's much more difficult is to play offense, to say what is the positive that gets the support. And here the challenge is economic. Stagnant incomes and a sense of breach in the generational promise, i.e. the next generation will do better than this one, have led to disillusion about today and pessimism about tomorrow. Hence the desire for radical change. But don't underestimate the public's intelligence. They want change that is practical those leading tough lives are wary of people promising revolutions, and those who are more comfortable don't want the revolutions anyway. Start with the real world. Analyze that without preconception, and it is clear that whichever government is in power will be dealing with a 21st century technology revolution, every bit as game-changing as the 19th century industrial revolution. And unfortunately, right now, policymakers and change makers are in two different worlds. So here is the 21st century progressive task to harness technology for economic and social change in a manner which promotes fairness, social justice and opportunity. That is the challenge of radical politics today. It requires mobilization of government, federal and local, Individuals need to be educated and empowered to succeed in the new world of work, and they can't do that on their own. And if properly understood and used, this technological revolution can cut the cost of essential services whilst at the same time improving their quality. And it is completely in tune with green politics. The environment is no longer a single issue stacked alongside all the others. It's pervasive. It's universal, it's about life choices, it's a whole political philosophy. It is perfect for the renaissance of progressive politics, but only if allied to realistic policy. So green politics itself is at an interesting political juncture. Green so-called New Deals, both sides of the Atlantic, which join forces with far left economics, endanger the very cause they claim to champion. Instead, it would be better to learn from, for example, the German green experience, which is making huge electoral strides, largely because it's perceived as advocating radical change whilst moving with the grain of the market and working with private enterprise. The doubling of Africa's population and India taking its rightful place at the table of economic giants will mean that there is no answer to climate change other than finding ways of consuming sustainably, which in turn means the acceleration of science and technology. So that should be our ambition. And it should be done practically in a way which maximizes unity in our countries. So in conclusion, 
Those who want to make the case for radical change make it best not by setting people against each other, but by showing that shared purpose and common endeavour advances us all together. The more reasonable our demeanour, the more palatable the radical change. A leftist populism is wrong in principle and self-destructive politically. We win from the progressive side when we address the future in the language of reason. So there is an irony in the progressive predicament. Progressive values aren't the problem. Sensibly applied, they're popular. We are too often the problem. Our outrage inhibits our thought. Our attachment to ideological purity obscures our understanding. And our self-discipline is in perpetual coalition with our propensity for self-indulgence. So my judgment is very clear. We will defeat the populism when we weave a new narrative of optimism about the future by understanding the future and embracing it. The challenge, therefore, is ultimately one of our character and our will. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're suitably distant from each other here. <laughs> yes. Uh, those are wonderful remarks, and I suspect any American listening to you will uh, you know, have a, find a lot of resonance with what has happened in our primary season, particularly on the Democratic side, where we've had a battle between uh, a, a more pragmatic progressivism and a more sort of uh, pure uh, a progressivism that aspires to a, a higher moral standard, it would say. Uh, and uh, we're, we're not through with that battle, but what you've said really uh, strikes home. And, and, uh, and it's a challenge for us as we in the United States and as Democrats choose our, our champion uh, to go up against Donald Trump in November. But before we get deeper, drill deeper into some of the political issues that you've raised and your, your very lucid prescriptions for what we should be thinking about on the progressive side, uh, let me ask a question about uh, the coronavirus, the, the issue that uh, is sort of overshadowing everything else here, and I suspect uh, almost everywhere uh, now. Um, and it's relevant to this discussion uh, because, uh, if nothing else, this virus is, is a huge test of government efficacy, to use your word, or capacity. Can governments deliver better than they've done? And you have a kind of a competition here. You have the Chinese who, where this uh, disease apparently originated, who are now bragging about their, uh, their efficacy. Uh, they, they recently put out a statement uh, uh, lauding their, themselves, as the Chinese Communist Party, for the, the strongest governance capacity in uh, human history. So the Chinese think they have a formula, it's called authoritarian capitalism or whatever, Leninism, whatever you want to call it, that uh, can solve problems like this better. Uh, President Trump last night spoke to this and called for some measures, including a travel ban. But what, is your, you know, what advantages do open and free and liberal societies bring to this challenge of, of uh, making people safe against this virus? Um, well, first of all, by the way, if you've got an open and free society, some of the problems in the concealment of the disease at the very beginning would not have occurred, I think. Right. So I, I, I wouldn't accept that the Chinese system in that sense is superior. They are able and have done a, a, an extraordinary job in, in mobilizing um, their, their country in order to, uh, well, it's not clear exactly whether it's going to defeat the disease or at least it's going to slow it down very significantly. Um, but you know, we can do those things too if we need to. Uh, and, you know, my view very simply with the coronavirus is the important thing is, and I think there are a lot of lessons about global coordination that we, we should learn after this, but in, in the short term, you've got to follow the scientific advice, you've got to do what is necessary, and you've got to, um, you know, take people through a, an explanation of what you're trying to achieve, which is essentially the slowing down of the path of the disease so that our healthcare systems can, can deal with it. And so that we um, you know, get to the point where eventually we're able to, to get a vaccine for it. Mm -hmm. 
but it's you know it's going to be it's it's a very tough crisis and obviously the real the calibration this is why it's very difficult for leaders is the damage you're going to do to your economy and by the way through that to your healthcare system vis the damage that the, the disease uh, will do so exactly and and you know so the question we're asking ourselves is are we overreaching or you know or, are yeah. we making and that's a, uh, it's a difficult some, judgment but i mean yeah, i don't goodness. i don't i don't I, I will never accept that a, an authoritarian society is, a, is better at dealing with the problems fundamentally. I mean, but I do think we have to recognize that this efficacy question is a big challenge. And it's, you know, there is a reason why it's interesting to me if you look at recent political slogans that have been successful. I think a big part of the appeal of President Trump is this idea he just, you know, punches as a hole through the wall, as I say. Um, you know, I think you can assume that, that if Mike Bloomberg, with all that resource, leave aside his campaign, but I think you can assume that, that the slogan he came out with was the product of a lot of in-depth research and the product, I think the slogan was something like, Mike will get it done, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. The slogan of Boris Johnson in the December uh, 2019 British general election was get Brexit done. Getting the job done is, is what people want to see. And the, the risk that you've got at the moment for the, for the progressive side is that you've got people who are radical but offering, in my view, the wrong sort of radicalism which the public won't accept. And it's not enough simply to be a moderate version of that. That's really what I'm saying. You've got to renew the progressive challenge right. um, and do it fundamentally. Otherwise, uh, although I think someone moderate will do better than someone extreme, someone moderate still won't win, in my view. So um, that's why I think you'll see a lot of, if, if uh, Joe Biden is your, your nominee, I mean, I think he, he will completely understand that and be putting a lot of effort into building a, a, a really a good, solid team mm -hmm. around him who are going to offer change, but of the right sort. All right. Thank you. Well, let, let us now go back to politics in a sense and, uh, and to our, our, our subject. But I want to ask about your party, particularly the Labor Party. Uh, you wrote a post-mortem of this blowout election in December in Britain in the New Statesman that caught my eye. And, and you said, uh, if I can read this, that uh, the, ex uh, the extraordinary thing is the Labor Party's desire to rewrite its only period of majority government in half a century in negative terms. And of course, we've had a lot of that here where I watched in uh, amazement during the nominating battle where we seem to be uh, uh, holding a referendum among Democratic candidates on uh, parts of the Clinton administration, <laughs> crime bill in 96, We're really looking backward and litigating old battles between the left and center. Um, why, why did our respective parties lurch so far to the left after uh, successful, long and successful stints in governing where most indices seem to move in the right direction? In your yeah, I mean, this, this is a, a great question. I think it's because um, there was a perception post-financial crisis, post 9-11, uh, that we needed a more radical politics because of the problems people were suffering. And when we should have gone to radical but modern, we went to radical but old fashioned. Mm -hmm. And you know, the fact is there's no, you, you're not gonna persuade people to go back in time to big state tax and spend politics. They, 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 if you offer them that, they'll just reject it uh, because it's not how they live their lives. It's not, you know, I had this discussion with people after the financial crisis where many people in my own party said, no, the, the public's now moved left. And I would say, where's your evidence? And they would say, well, you know, they would say, well, there's a financial crisis, you know, there's the failure of the market, da, 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 da. And I would say, all you're telling me is why you think they should have moved left. What I'm asking you is, <laughs> what's the evidence they did? And there isn't any. Because when times are tough, you know, people, they want practical solutions and they want, you know, they want to know that you're, you're addressing the future. And the coalition that, that brought uh, Bill Clinton to power, brought myself to power in, 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 in the UK, and we'd never been in power for two successive full terms before we came to power in 1997. We actually governed twice as long as the last Labour government ever in history. And we were able to make change by being in power. But yes, we kept our coalition together. 
you know, we were regarded as pro-business and enterprise. Uh, we made sure that, you know, even though trade unions had a place in our party and in, and, and in our consultations, that nonetheless, you know, we decided policy as a government. Um, you know, the, the, so the risk for the left is that it goes left on economic policy when, when there isn't evidence the public wanted. They end up in a kind of quasi anti-Western foreign policy uh, because of Iraq and Afghanistan and 9-11, but it's not really where the public is. Um, even if they don't like those particular military engagements and disagree with them even, they're, they're not going to respect you if you move far to the left on foreign policy. And then if you're not careful, the bit that you add that's new is around the kind of identity politics side where, you know, this is just a, a, um, this is a mugs game for, mm -hmm. for, for the center left because we'll just lose. But, but economic or left-wing economic populism dies hard. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn ran on that kind of platform, or you could say it's an old left platform. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, and it was so pretty much a throwback. Um, and we've seen Bernie Sanders not succeeding thus far with the leftmost platform of any uh, person seeking the Democratic nomination in my lifetime. And, you know, what, what Corbyn's uh, friends and supporters say is that, well, you know, we... Our, manifest, our manifesto was popular, even if our candidate wasn't. And we're hearing the same thing from some of Bernie Sanders' supporters. Well, we've won the, we've won the policy argument, the intellectual argument, even though we don't quite have the nomination sewed up. Um, is there anything to that? What do you think of this theory that we hear from our friends on the left, and particularly the young left, that you, know, you, have, to have, a, uh, you have to have candidates of uncompromising radicalism in the race just to broaden the parameters of what it is possible to debate. Mm. Yeah, so, so the, the, the big problem is to define what radical means. I mean, my problem with a lot of these people, I mean, let me not talk about Bernie Sanders, and I'm not so qualified, but with Jeremy Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn and, and the people within the left of the Labour Party, they were just proposing a set of old fashioned solutions that weren't really radical. I mean, they were radical in the sense that they had a great capability to offend large numbers of people, but they weren't radical in the sense that they would produce real change. So, you know, an end to reform in education and healthcare, um, abolition of tuition fees, which in our case, it may be different for you, but in our case, that simply means you'd be spending a large amount of government money on university students, when obviously the, 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 the task today is to make sure that underprivileged and disadvantaged children at a young age get the type of early years education that they, they need and families get support. And, you know, yes, of course, there's a strong case in the UK. I mean, we introduced tuition fees, my government, but we introduced them in a much fairer way than tuition fees now are. But we did that to keep our universities at the forefront of, of um, innovation, uh, technological change. Um, and actually, that has allowed them to do so. The American universities are probably the most successful, well, they are the most successful anywhere, anywhere in the world by long distance. So maybe you reform your system, but, you know, you get rid of it. Uh, you're just going to be spending large amounts of money subsidizing the middle class. I don't, it, it, to me it's a, and by middle class in our, sorry, in British terms, it means kind of mm. uh, one level up. Um, but, you know, so, so this is, the question you've got to go to is what does being radical today mean? And what I say is you start with an analysis of the world. And this technology revolution is the biggest thing. Now, interestingly, by the way, Bernie Sanders had a program on technology that was in fact a good idea. I actually read it and thought it was interesting. Um, and, you know, so I'm, th there's parts of this that, that, that are really important, but as opposed to it being, oh yeah, and there's the tech, what we're gonna do in technology. My view, you've got to pull that and put it right at the center. The, every job in the, in the world's gonna change as a result of technology, you know. You, you should educate differently as, as a result of technology. Your healthcare system's got to be re, re, redesigned. Government itself should be redesigned. You know, you've got enormous possibilities and obviously huge displacement effects. That's what we need to go to. So my argument with these guys is not, oh, look, you guys are too radical. What we need to do is something more moderate. My argument is it's not really radical. <laughs> well, uh, I want to come back to the technology point, which is very important in a minute, but let me, let me pick up on this idea of what is radical and, and to whom. 
And, uh, and by the way, I should have said at the outset, uh, we're very grateful that a lot of folks who are out there watching the live stream and, and on C-SPAN have uh, sent in some questions. So let me now ask a question that somebody sent in that goes right to this point. Basically, the short uh, question is, uh, how, do you, how do you convince young people uh, that uh, radicalism, uh, that your kind of practical radicalism is cool? But let me, I'll ask the question that, you know, so the, 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 uh, both the U.S. nomination battle and, the, and your election last December ex exposed a massive generational divide among progressives with younger voters siding overwhelmingly with uh, Sanders in our country and Corbyn in yours. Older voters overwhelmingly opting for moderate candidates. You know, what can moderate politics Politicians do, like Joe Biden do to bring younger voters into the coalition, persuade them that you know, pragmatic leaders uh, can deliver the degree of change that they're, uh, you know, that they're yearning. Yeah. So this is, I mean, look, this is a problem I also grappled with when I first became leader of the Labour Party, and you, you, you're you're on the way to losing the battle when you're described as moderate and they're described as radical. Um, I mean, actually, what is interesting at this last election in the UK, in fact. The biggest fall in uh, the Corbyn vote between 2019 and 2017 was actually amongst young people, and I think what what, what you've got to do is it's it's all a it's a question for young people explaining how the issues that they they need dealing with around housing opportunity, um, education that you you've got to. You've got policies that can deal with them practically, and what's more, you can do so in the context where you're putting together a broad enough coalition to win. I mean, the thing that frustrates me about this situation is, you know, we, we've now lost four elections in a row in the, in, the, in the Labour Party. And, you know, there's no point in being radical if you, if, if by defining radical in the way you are, you literally put it beyond your ability to win because it's only when you win, you're able to do things and able to help people. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a combination of redefining radical and explaining why putting together a coalition that allows you to win is not a, a destruction of principle. It's the only way that you can implement it. Mm -hmm. uh, and still, because I get this from my, uh, my millennial daughter, <laughs> their faith in... Uh, the kind of radical pragmatism, which is PPI slogan, uh, that you're talking about is just, you know, it's who's doing it too. It's, you know, it isn't just the, it's not just the essence of the policy change that you're proposing, it's who's proposing it. We, we find that we just have to, you know, convince people that uh, uh, we can really bring something big, uh, that bring about larger changes. But let me ask you, going, I want one more question on this, on this, uh, this fascinating December election. Uh, because again, there's some striking parallels with what's happened in this country. Uh, Boris Johnson moved to the left on the economy. He, he renounced uh, the Tories' previous interest in austerity and announced a lot of big spending uh, programs and sounded a lot more, more like Trump in, in 2016, who did not sound like your typically fiscally austere uh, you know, Republican uh, and who embraced uh, some of the left's agenda, anti-trade, absolute no modernization of the big social enti welfare entitlement. So uh, what does this do um, to, to, to you know, progressive parties to see the right uh, stealing a march on our turf? Uh, and, and let me add to that, you know, uh, uh, our, my friend Matt Goodwin, a British uh, uh, political commentator, has talked about what he calls the unwritten law of politics in this era of populism, which is that it's easier for the right to move left on economics than it is for the left to move right on questions of culture and identity. Uh, I want to come back to that, but on the question of the economy, when uh, the center right moves into this territory, how, do, how does the center left respond to that? You respond to it perfectly simply by, if, if, if you think they should be sp spending more money on healthcare than they are, you say that's fine. But here are the, the changes that are going to mean that we do this in a fair a, a way that actually brings opportunity to people. The right will never get the need for a long-term strategy that builds strength for the future. Uh, they'll only ever snatch at these policies because they're, you know, that they will bring a, a, you know, momentarily they, they look popular. But it's our job to dive deep and come up with a platform that is a, a true embrace of the future and a way of getting to the 
you know, the origins of injustice and unfairness, but we can only do that if, for example, on things like education, we're prepared to confront those who will hold back education reform when education reform is necessary. Or, you know, of course, if you, if you say, if you say to the right, you own law and order, we're not really interested in that, fine, you, but you know, most people care about it. So you've got to, the thing, the thing about this is that it's not, it's, it's not a situation where you, whatever the right do, you've got to kind of disagree with. If you happen to think they're doing something that's correct, right? Let's supposing in our case, the government says they want to spend more money on healthcare, fine, they're going to spend more money on healthcare. We've been advocating that. It validates the arguments we've made. But actually, the real issue in Britain today is how you reorganize healthcare in the era of technology. That's the question. Because diagnosis, treatment, how you manage long-term conditions, social care, all of these things are going to, should be changed. And we will be much better at engaging with that analysis of the future. But if you, if you end up saying, for example, um, you know, the test of whether you're really in favor of jobs or not is, how, is, is whether you're prepared to denounce free trade. That's what your radical policy is. Yeah, you're at risk of the right coming along and stealing it. Mm -hmm. But actually, that's not really radical because you're not going to create a lot more jobs by shutting down trade. You're actually going to create more jobs by pre preparing people for the work of the future. Right, it, it, uh, but it, it does create these uncomfortable moments for s progressives here to wake up and find themselves maybe a little to the right of Donald Trump on, a, on, a, on an, on an economic issue. Yeah, but you know, this is, I always used to say this to people when they, they'd, they, they were gone to me about, you know, we introduced a lot of measures, along with things like the minimum wage and, uh, and gay rights and, and peace in Northern Ireland. We also did some very tough stuff on law and order, antisocial behavior in local communities. You know, drug dealers who were operating with impunity and people would say to me, you're mimicking the right. And I'd say, I'm standing up for our people. And, and your welfare to work. Uh, yeah, I mean, reform. look, in the end, it is, the, it is working class people, working class communities who believe that their taxes go to pay for benefits for people and they want to make sure that if benefits are being paid, that people have some sort of obligation. They treat it as a matter of fairness, not right or left. So it, it's, this, these are uh, basic things which if you, <laughs> you know, this is why I say to play defense. Playing defense is very, very clear. If you're not patriotic, you're not strong in law and order, you're not strong in defense, and you don't understand the issues around immigration, forget it. You might as well check out and go do, go do something else. Because certainly over our side of the Atlantic, in no European, and I include Britain for these purposes, but <laughs> in, no, in no European country are you going to win an election unless you get those things. Every now we know that Britain is not a European country anymore since we can still fly. Well, we are. Except we, flights. We, uh, from... we may alter our relationship <laughs> with the European Union, but we won't no, alter I, our I, geography I'm or history. Talking <laughs> about the flight ban. But um, in any oh, yeah, event, uh, yeah. uh, but let's, let's drill down on the, you know, sort of the question of the relationship of progressives and markets for a moment, because we've heard so much in our campaign here, and certainly Jeremy Corbyn being a sort of old style socialist, you heard it there in the years of his running the Labor Party. But you know, one thing that seems to unite left and right populists is uh, you know, a hatred of neoliberalism. Uh, they accuse you of that, they accuse Bill Clinton of that, uh, they accuse even Barack Obama of it. Uh, and, and they mean by what, I, I never understand what they mean by neoliberalism in this context. It, uh, is it that we, ha we have an untrammeled faith in the belief of markets? In inordinate faith of the, in, in the belief in markets that caused us to be blind to the harm done to working class people by globalization, by technological change. You know the, you know this, the, okay. the line. So, first of all, no one from my side of politics has ever believed that markets can do no wrong or that markets are, you know, God. So whatever the market says, you've got to go along with. And when people you say to me often about the financial crisis, well, you know, there wasn't proper systems of regulation. I say, yeah, with the benefit of hindsight, there wasn't. And if we'd had the hindsight at the time, <laughs> we would have been changing it. But markets, in terms of people having consumer choice, um, Markets in terms of a competitive market in which you improve um, your ability to offer products and services that people want. Look, this is the way of the world and people live their lives, they live their lives on their mobile phone today. 
They're making choices the whole time. You start shutting down markets, you just, people, people aren't gonna regard that as, as creating a fairer society. They'll regard that as just taking choice away. Does that mean that markets should operate without regulation? Of course not. They should be properly regulated and there's big debates around that. But, you know, private enterprise is important and it's gonna become more important because many more people certainly in our country are gonna be self-employed, they're gonna be starting their own businesses, technology again will change all of that. Um, and, you know, being anti-market is, is just, where is the evidence over the last 100 years of history that that is a sensible position to take? So it's not, this, this to me is almost just a, an, an irrelevant ideological argument. It's having an ideological argument for the sake of it and then designated as neoliberal, uh, you know, we introduced the minimum wage. We never had a minimum wage in Britain before. We introduced one. What, what's that? Neoliberal? No, obviously not. You're interfering with the market. It's just, it's just basic common sense. These things, if you end up making markets into an ideological divide like that, you'll end up with a huge problem. Because all you'll do is, is, is uh, say to business and industry, you're basically anti them, because that's what a little... Uh, result and you know and as I said to people in the Labour Party after the last election question number one how much business to support did the Labour Party have at the last election answer none question two uh, has any political party in Britain ever won an election without business support of some sort at least to a limited degree no and number three are we actually addressing that problem now in the Labour Party no so Okay, you carry on like that. The people that create the jobs are businesses and industry. And, you know, of course they've got to operate with proper rules. But a competitive private sector is a good thing for an economy. It's not a bad thing. Amen. But we have heard a lot in our election here. Uh, a lot of the discourse coming from the left uh, is that basically defines the private sector as, as, a, as an enemy. And this, I guess, is still the lingering effects of the the financial uh, yeah, but crisis. That's why, that's why I say that the, 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 the mistake of the left, I'm afraid, after the financial crisis was to confuse a failure of the financial markets with a, conf with a failure of markets. Right. But let's <laughs> concretize this a little bit more be because I think on the, prog the progressive debate kind of comes down to your view of innovation. And we're, we're in your camp. We, 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 we think that technological innovation creates great opportunities for spreading the gains that so far have been uh, concentrated in the, in the digitized sector of the, of the economy to the physical economy, mm. as you digitize uh, the, phys the physical sectors of the economy, which are much larger. That's where all the people are. And if you can get productivity gains there through innovation, you can get higher wages and, and answer some of this angst about you know, growing inequality. Uh, but there is this, you know, techno pessimism. You heard, we heard a lot in our campaign about breaking up the big tech company. They have too much power. They're they're squashing competition, um, and, uh, and a lot of a lot of times the argument is just that they're just too damn big. Uh, and uh, you know, but there is a tendency among the more sophisticated critics. You know, innovation's a threat. It, it puts people out of jobs. And it kind of moves them down the economic ladder into, into jobs that are lower wages, particularly if they don't have college degrees or better. If they're lower wage mm. workers. Um, how do we revive you know, a sense of optimism about economic progress and technological progress without seeming to be you know, disregarding the people that are, you know, all those truckers and drivers that are gonna lose their jobs because of driverless cars, for example, without, you know, there's a fair argument to be made with we didn't in you know in, in when you know in the past pay sufficient attention to the transition and help for those kinds of uh, those people and and uh, so this this question of technological optimism or pessimism I think is important in this debate. Yeah, no, I think this is absolutely uh, correct. But the way I look at it is that the technology revolution is going to happen. I mean, it is like the 19th century industrial revolution. By the way, my institute did a paper a few months back, which is quite an interesting analysis of how in the 19th century, it took politics decades to catch up with the Industrial Revolution. And I think you're in the same thing today. If you're talking about regulating big tech, the politicians get it, okay? Regulation, they understand, right? 
big companies, they understand. You've got to regulate them. And okay, there's a, a debate about, around all that. You know, do you break them up? Do you not break them up? And so on. But the key thing is to understand that digitization and artificial intelligence and time quantum computing are going to change the world radically and dramatically. And you need a government that understands it and helps people through it. And this is a great progressive cause, particularly when you're also dealing with the environment. But, you know, green politics is an enormous opportunity for the progressive side, only though if it's realistic. If you turn green politics into we're against consumption, you're going to lose that battle. You're going to turn it actually into the next chapter of a culture war with the right that you'll lose. And in any event, people will say quite rightly, unless you invent the science and technology that allows sustainable consumption, you know, the developing countries of the world are going to consume and they, they're not. I can't go, to, we, my institute works all over Africa. We have big projects there and all the presidents that I work with want to build airports, build airlines, build power stations. You're going to have to help them to do it sustainably. If I go there and say, no, no, because of the problem we've created, you guys can't grow, you'd be run out of town pretty fast and quite rightly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all of this technology revolution, it's going to happen. You don't want to stop driverless cars. It's going to happen. So the question is, how do we manage this? Now, people, I think, if we, th if we show that we are the people who understand this technology revolution, can make sense of it, can harness its benefits and deal with its displacement effects, so that we're helping with building the right infrastructure, educating and training, making sure that new jobs are available, all of which requires an act of state, an act of society and government. Um, then, you know, we'll, we'll be, you know, m massively in the right position. But if we, if we use it as an excuse to, to kind of rehabilitate old left economics, we'll literally find we lose the, the argument. Mm -hmm. And this is why it's, a, it's an important battle to have. And again, the issue is the radical thing to do is to reimagine your economy through the science and technology. The not radical thing to do is to say, stop the world. I want to turn the clock back because that is never going to work. Right. Thank you. Well, let's, let's uh, turn from economics to, uh, to the politics of culture and identity for a minute because this is so obviously powerful in explaining this populist surge around the world. Uh, you, you said, I've seen, or you've written that uh, the center left parties have made a mistake, particularly in Europe, I think you were talking about, but I think the same could be made here. Uh, that they've made a mistake in sort of not engaging people's grievances around mm. immigration. Uh, and during our primary season, particularly in the early going, we saw a kind of a stampede to very liberal positions, that is uh, almost open borders positions, a decriminalization uh, of illegal immigration. Uh, and, uh, you know, all, you know, I think... Uh, because no one wanted to sound anything like Donald Trump and his nativist, mm. uh, and frankly, on the Democratic side, we would say bigoted policies. Mm. So um, how, how can progressive parties deal with the legitimate grievances of voters or engage those uh, legitimate grievances mm. uh, without in any way countenancing the, the sort of the bigotry that uh, many sort of middle class and suburban voters hear and the anti-immigration arguments. So, so my answer to this is very, very simple. Stop worrying about what the right is saying and work out the ground you want to camp on. What is the fair and right ground to camp on? In respect of immigration, it's very simple. You want rules, you don't want prejudices, right? So you've got to construct an immigration system where of course there have got to be controls. You know, there's, there's no country on earth going to just have people come in if people are coming in illegally okay you can get very difficult cases you've got to deal with once that's happened particularly when there are children involved all of that is obvious but the public can't be in any doubt you're against illegal immigration or you don't want controls around immigration otherwise you just you just lose lose that debate and that's why it's so important that you know one of the things the right does brilliantly to the progressive side is it it baits it with its rhetoric and some of its policies. Uh, we always rise to the bait. You, you, you can't do that. You've just got to be completely dispassionate about it and say, look, this is the sensible position on immigration. And um, 
you know, the fact of the matter is most people, I think, understand that immigration has been good for your country. Most people, by the way, understand immigration has been good for my country. Right? It's, done an, it's been a, of enormous benefit. Most people believe that immigrants should be treated fairly and should be welcomed into our society. Most people actually believe that. But you only get the right to advocate it if you're prepared to deal with what is an obvious concern, which is when people are coming into your country, there's got to be some structure around it and some rules to it. Um, okay, well, thank you. Um, that raises a host of questions, but I, we don't have time to do them all, so I'm <laughs> going to move on to another topic that I wanted to ask you about, and that is uh, sort of patriotism. You've talked about this, too, and this has been a besetting problem for Democrats for decades, really, is they often get outmaneuvered in sounding uh, patriotic uh, by the other side. And, you know, obviously right-wing populists like Donald Trump and Boris Johnson, if that's an accurate description of him, uh, certainly Orban and others, uh, uh, have touched a nerve by, t you know, defending national sovereignty and national identity against the globalist and the cosmopolitan elites who were from nowhere. Uh, and uh, how, again, how can progressives sort of reclaim uh, a, a good kind of nationalism, that is, a, you know, a nationalism that's not chauvinistic, but, you know, patriotism properly understood. Uh, where have we gone wrong on the center left in uh, abandoning that ground? Well, I think, again, I mean, I, I find this quite easy to deal with. You've got to be prepared to use the right language about patriotism and belief in your country and love of your country. This is important and sensible people know how to articulate that. But the reason I was against Brexit was because I think it would damage my country's interests, which by the way, it will. But you know, you need to frame it as being to the benefit of your country and not frame it as if, you know, I'm pro-European rather than pro-British. I mean, <laughs> unsurprisingly, that's an argument you'll lose. And, you know, it's like when, you know, if, if, if you say, I, I'm, I want Britain first, right? No one's ever going to run for office saying, I want my country second. But the question is, what does it mean? And that's where we need to be, you know, you just need to be, one of the things about the, the progressive side of politics, you have to, an average, I mean, I always say this, an average conservative can win. To win as a progressive, you've got to be good. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got, to be, you've got to be politically competent. That's what I mean by political competence. If you're allowing your opponents to portray you as unpatriotic, you're doing something wrong, because right? you're never gonna win if people think you're that. I mean, and of course, that was one of the many problems with, 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 with Jeremy Corbyn. But, you know, it means that you're prepared to Stand up for your country, exhibit some pride in it. And we should be proud of our countries. I mean, yours is a great country, mine's a great country. I mean, okay, they've got all sorts of faults that we want to correct and deal with. But people need to know that you're, you know, you're patriotic, you're proud of your country. So if someone starts making an issue over your flag, for example, or something, I mean, don't put yourself on the wrong side of that argument, because you're just gonna lose it. You know, and you've, you've got to be, the problem always with progressive leaders is that always, always, always comes a moment when it's got to be clear to the public that they're in charge and whatever's being shouted at them by their activist base. And look, I support activists. Political parties can't work without activists. I was an activist myself. <laughs> but the fact is that always comes a moment when that progressive leader's got to make it clear that they're in charge and no one's gonna push them around. Because the other thing that people fear about progressive politics, and the, my party's manifesto at the last election was classic. Every pressure group that knocks on your door, calling themselves justice for this, or you know, empowerment for that, oh yeah, okay, we'll write in that policy as well. No, you can have that policy. Okay, here's another billion pounds for this. Or People want to know that you're, you're hard-headed enough to be able to say no to your own supporters. And it always matters more. Uh, the reasons for it are complicated, but it always matters more for the progressives than the conservatives. The conservatives can get away with playing to their base. Progressives, it's always more, more difficult. 
That is, that's, a great, that's a great point, and unfortunately, we have to end on that point because we're out of time, but this is a, this is a debate that's still happening here. You know, to what extent do we, do we be, win this battle against the right by emulating their techniques and the, some of their impracticality? Uh, and you've, you've laid a higher burden on the center-left and progressives. Yeah, because what I, just to, to finish it off, we shouldn't worry about, we, we should worry about ourselves, right? Whatever they do, they're going to do, but we should worry about ourselves. And the other final point I'd make is we should link up across the Atlantic as well. All, every single country in Europe, the center-left's got the same problem today. Right. Well, you know how to do that. You've done it before, and I hope we can do it again. And unfortunately, we are going to have to end there. But thank you so much for a fascinating conversation. It was really uh, lucid and uh, persuasive and challenging. And uh, we really appreciate the chance to connect again. And, Thanks, Will. And, and to take you up on that challenge to re re reinvigorate the center-left conversation across national borders. A good friend of mine uh, said to me recently that the challenge of great leadership is to make uh, what is necessary politically attractive. And this is a man who has shown uh, an uncanny ability to do that. So thank you so much for being with Thanks, us, Phil. Tony Blair. It's a pleasure. Thank you, everyone.